Energia just announced that one of its subsidiaries, Rialto Bioenergy Facility, initiated voluntary Chapter 11 restoring proceedings in the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the Southern District of California. I declare bankruptcy! Now that's big news, as Rialto is not only Energia's flagship asset, but also North America's largest organic-to-waste energy facility. And quite ironically, that's also the reason why they're in trouble. Indeed, the plant can process 700 tons of food waste and 300 tons of biosolids per day, and if it slowly ramps up its feedstock sourcing, it's still far from its full capacity, which severely impacts its income. But how can Energia, an acclaimed company praised by everyone in the water and sustainable world, recently awarded net zero carbon champion and wastewater project of the year at the global water awards be in so much trouble well because of one clear weakness it shares with most of the water industry a strong dependence on regulations If you don't know Energia, well, shame on you because that means you missed my interview with the legendary Andrew Benedek and my in-depth exploration with Kunal Shah their chief gross officer shame Hey. Well, if you don't know Energia, Energia leverages anaerobic digestion to turn waste with an S into energy through its technology suit and a differentiated approach. I say waste with an S because that's actually a clear USP of the company. They can blend solid municipal waste, agricultural waste, and of course, wastewater and its byproducts. Now, they could just sell those technologies, and to a certain extent, they do, but they'd rather go for the differentiated approach of DBFOM, standing for Design, Build, Finance, Operate, and Maintain. We're taking risk capital, we are masterminding We've proven that at scale at our Rialto Bioenergy facility and many more where we go in the beginning when financiers don't want to go for sure. So how did Rialto turn from a flagship to a struggling asset? Well, it looks like an alignment of all the wrong planets. First, the plant was designed to leverage a Californian state law, SB 1383, that targets a 75% cut in organic waste disposal by 2025. Would the law be enforced, organic waste disposal in a landfill would be fined, creating a strong incentive to divert the waste flux and find a way to valorize it. And so the Rialto Bioenergy facility would get its feedstock, ramp up to capacity, and California would transform an environmental burden into a sustainability asset. Win, win, win. The law was signed in 2016, but its enforcement got delayed by the pandemic, and further so this May, when an independent state oversight agency recommended posing it and accepting that California wouldn't reach its 2025 target. In between, the city of Los Angeles waited until late 2022 to take an implementation ordinance that shall enable law enforcement in January 2024. So regulation, that's the first of our wrong planets aligned in how do you call it? This past year has just been a perfect storm of problems. Okay, so the second planet in our perfect storm of problems is location. Natural gas is a relatively cheap commodity in the US, currently trading at $2.24 per million British thermal units. What, what was this thing with all these numbers? I had no clue either what a British thermal unit is, so I googled it, and it is the quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of one pound of liquid water from 39 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Great! I'm even more confused now, so let me convert that to what I understand. Natural gas in the US trades at $7.72 per megawatt hour. Now I understand. Right now in Europe, natural gas trades at $25.43 for that same megawatt hour, so roughly 3.3 times more. Hence, would the Rialto Bioenergy facility be in Europe, its renewable natural gas would not only be a sustainability asset, but probably also a cost-competitive energy source. But the US has shell gas. You don't care about the environment? Joker. Third and last plant in this alignment, we have to address Energia's overall shape. In February, the company's stock traded at $4.5 per share. Today, it's been divided by 8 at $0.57 per share. If Energia was printing cash overall, it could afford to cover Rialto's losses in waiting for better days and regulation enforcement. But that wrongly aligned planet in California is unfortunately not so much of an exception. Even today, there are many countries in the world which do not have regulations and incentives for organic waste management, for biomethane or RNG. That's where I want to highlight a huge dichotomy. On the one hand, there's what we hear and read in the press. Big political announcements like the Repower AU plan announced by Ursula von der Leyen in May 2022. They even made a thrilling video with epic music to show how we're acting now. 
And in the same time, you find that Energia's asset in Italy experienced delayed electrical utility connections and other permitting issues. There's what's announced and there's what's done. And unfortunately, there's a delay between those two and the delay's length is almost unpredictable. That's a trouble we're well aware of in the water industry. Let me take an example. At the beginning of the 2010s, the International Maritime Organization and the US Coast Guard adopted new regulations that push for the adoption of ballast water treatment on ships because that was the right thing to do in order to protect the ocean's biosphere. As a result, market research companies were blooming with reports like this one, expecting a $111 billion market for water technology companies by 2022 at a nice 37% compound annual growth rate instead of what the ballast water treatment market weights today $5.8 billion, which is about 20 times less. Wow, that must hurt. It does. What happened? Well, the enforcement of regulations got delayed and watered down. It never got extended from new builds to existing ships and so on and so on. Do you think that's a one-off? All right, let's take a look at another example. In the year 2000, the European Commission adopted the Water Framework Directive. It was supposed to achieve good qualitative and quantitative status for all water bodies by 2015. Wastewater specialists understood that as a clear sign tertiary and quaternary treatment would be installed at scale in Europe to better treat phosphorus and nitrogen, but also micropollutants. And I can tell you that as a young water professional, about 10 years ago, working on the first wastewater treatment plants to eliminate micropollutants in France, then the first in Switzerland and later the first in Sweden, I was absolutely sure I was contributing contributing to a wave that would take Europe by storm by the end of the decade. But again, the regulation got watered down when adopted by the various European countries, and its enforcement date was made negotiable and possible to push back, so that one decade later, there's barely a handful of good pupils outside of Switzerland and Germany. There's a pattern emerging here. Indeed, I'm discussing regulation, but do you notice one more red thread between Energia's story and my two ballast water and advanced sewage treatment examples? They're all on the wastewater side, and I would hypothesize it's not a coincidence. Coincidence? I think not! Paul O'Callaghan has theorized how crisis-driven innovation gets adopted twice faster in the water sector. We saw that very clearly with the adoption of ultrafiltration membranes in the early 1990s. The outbreak of cryptosporidium in places like Milwaukee in the UK drove rapid regulation of the need to deal with cryptosporidium and that drove rapid adoption of ultrafiltration membranes in drinking water treatment. If you hadn't had that cryptosporidium outbreak in 1987 in Milwaukee, you would not have seen that level of uptake. And we see similar things with, for example, PFAS at the moment. Crisis being here pretty one-to-one -one understood as there's a problem that's serious enough to trigger a regulation that also promptly gets enforced. Andrew Benedict, the CEO of Energia, is a key stakeholder in Paul's thesis. Indeed, his involvement in the takeoff and adoption of membrane bioreactors through his previous company, Xenon, is another example of crisis-driven market adoption as the takeoff happened when water scarcity urged water reuse, MBRs being the perfect vehicle for exactly that. So what's different this time with wastewater in general? and renewable natural gas in particular. Now, a crisis is usually a piece of legislation, but if you take really extreme floods or droughts or eutrophication, that's in essence it, and, and we certainly are facing that now, so. All these extreme events are arguably part of the same story, climate change. This should be a crisis big enough for us to overcome, and it should drive the adoption of virtuous approaches such as turning agricultural, municipal and water waste into net zero renewable energy. Yet, the reason it's difficult to take off without the right regulatory nudge is well summarized by George McGraw. The reason that that has continued is because we have a wrong pockets problem, what economists would call yeah. this wrong pockets problem. You know, the, the societal benefits don't accrue to the same folks that would necessarily make the investment to solve the problem. In the Rialto case, if the waste producers were to take their waste streams to Energia's facility instead of a landfill, it would for sure be the right move from a sustainability perspective. But the windfalls of acting right wouldn't end in the right pocket from a purely financial perspective, so it doesn't happen as long as government finds don't bring a balance in the force. Without a government, there can be no balance in the force. If Energia was playing Monopoly, 
their move in Rialto would be a kind of mortgage. gauge. As their press release states, the company expects it to have a positive impact on its 2023 cash flows, as Energia would cease supporting the plant with further loans or equity contributions. And if SP1383 finally gets enforced by early 2024, their other statement will probably hold true. Energia anticipates that with future adequate feedstock to allow ramp up, the asset will retain long-term value for all stakeholders. In the meantime, the company will slightly pivot its strategy to reduce its risk exposure by only developing assets with equity partners or providing more capex sales like their recent project in South Africa. Will they succeed in bringing their growth back on track and turning profitable? Well, let me reframe that one. Look me in the eye and answer that question. Is it the right move to turn waste into recovered resources and zero carbon energy? Don't look in the eye. So you see, I guess we all somewhat root for Energia on this one. And you know what? I'll even leave the final words to Andrew Benedict. But just before that, if you like this kind of content, you can at the same time support me and ensure you won't miss future releases by subscribing to this channel. So I'll see you next time. And Andrew, the scene is yours. I just want you to know, Antoine, that that is really your future. And I'm working for your future because if we don't solve this, you won't have one. What I want to tell you is that the older I get, the more ambitious I get because the problem is so big. I really want to find a solution. I'm not doubting it, that I have the right solution. I am very nervous about the speed, whether or not it can be done in time to avoid a major catastrophe. We're having catastrophes every day but I'm worried about billions of people dying. Nothing ever happens the way you think it should. If you have any doubts whatsoever, you won't make it. One, you have to absolutely believe that whatever it is that you want to do, you can do. Two, you have to be persistent. But if you are a believer and you're persistent and you're willing to work at it, miracles happen. <laughs>